morning. Welcome to the special occasion of the Southeast Asia Parliamentarians Against Corruption or CEPAC Conference and General Assembly 2023 with the title Parliamentary Action on Political Finance Oversight and Combating Green Corruption in Southeast Asia. This conference is uh, jointly hosted by CEPAC and the Indonesian House of uh, Representatives. Uh, my name is Enda Ratmasuti. I'm the Director for Interparliamentary Cooperation at the Indonesian House of Representatives and also the Executive Director of the CEPAC Secretariat. Allow me to begin by thanking all honorable delegates, panelists, and esteemed guests for participating uh, in this conference. CEPAC is a network of Southeast Asian parliamentarians who have common concern and focus on issues of anti-corruption and good governance. Established in Manila, March 2005, this network operates as a regional chapter of the global organizations of the Parliamentarians Against Corruption, or GOPEC. Along with uh, its members from across the region, CEPAC aims to establish a strong advocacy uh, network that works through capacity buildings, facilitation of research, as well as sharing best practices and lessons learned among members of parliamentarians and uh, experts. In this year's conference, we will specifically discuss the contemporary issues of political finance, green corruption, and participatory <coughs> budgeting and post-audit. We also encourage uh, honorable members of parliaments who are attending and who are not yet member of uh, CEPAC, you may do so by filling out the form in front of you or by contacting our secretariat, uh, Dita. Where is Dita? Dita, can you stand up? So Dita will help you with the registration process. We also invite all MPs and CEPAC members to stay for the General Assembly later today, scheduled at 3 p.m. on our agenda. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, for the opening, we will have the remarks from the President of CEPAC, uh, Dr. Fadli Zon, who is also the Chair for the Committee for Interparliamentary Cooperation. Pak Fadli, the floor is yours. Thank you. Honorable members of parliaments of Southeast Asian countries, uh, excellencies, ambassadors, and representatives of the embassies of the Southeast Asian countries to Indonesia, Secretary General of AIPA, distinguished delegates, uh, ladies and gentlemen, Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Peace be upon us all. Good morning. On behalf of the Southeast Asia Parliamentarians Against Corruption, CPAC, and the Indonesian House of Representatives, allow me to welcome you all this morning to the CEPAC Conference and General Assembly 2023, Parliamentary Actions on Political Finance Oversight and Combating Green Corruption in Southeast Asia. Allow me to start by drawing your attention to the massive global challenges we face today. The wars heightened, the climate crisis worsened, and the extreme poverty rage on. More than 124 million people have fallen below the poverty line, and more than 131 million are on the verge of extreme famine. At the same time, 2.6 trillion US dollar or 5% of global GDP has lost to corruption annually. Money that could have been invested in improving governance, strengthening social protection and transitioning to the green economy. At the regional level, we face on an overall decline in the levels of democracy, including the stagnation and even regression of the Corruption Perception Index, CPI, in 2022. Without strong commitments in devising anti-corruption strategies, this problem will not only damage our democracy today, but also to profoundly self-perpetuate across the entire population and future generations. As a parliamentary network dedicated on anti-corruption issues, CAPAC is committed to foster collaborate, advocate, and promote good governance at the regional and international levels. 
Our network supports parliamentarians to reinforce their key roles in preventing and curbing corruption through their constitutional mandates, which become even more significant today in safeguarding democracy for the people. Together, we call for a more robust framework to strengthen parliamentary commitment in advancing anti-corruption, putting it high in the global, regional, and national agenda. Distinguished delegates, we conduct this conference with main topics that I believe set out the contemporary debate of today's democracy and development, political finance, and green corruption. Money can have a corrupting influence on the political process and opaque uh, political finance threatens democracy around the globe. Without an adequate oversight system, sufficient regulations and strong control measures on political finance, the functioning of democracy and long-term economic development will be adversely threatened. This is also a very timely topic as some of the Southeast Asian countries, including Indonesia, will soon conduct their elections and others in the region has just completed them. Through our discussion, I hope we can reflect upon our experiences and strengthen our oversight mechanism as the main component of an effective political finance regimes. Another pressing issue is that of green corruption including fund and resource mobilization in the implementation of net zero plates. Parliament must be strategically equipped to oversee those implementations and ensure greater transparency and accountability on national and international climate actions. In 2019, the ANCAC adopted a resolution 812 calling its member states to prevent and combat environmental corruption. I hope our discussion today will cover ways to ensure a more strategic engagement of parliamentarians in the implementation of that resolution. Distinguished delegates, we are very fortunate today to have the esteemed panelists and experts to guide our discussion on the said topics. I hope we can substantially engage in our comprehensive discussions and get acquainted with good practices in developing effective parliamentary mechanism for strengthening the anti-corruption measures and legislation relevant with the political finance and green uh, corruption. I know there are still many challenges ahead in exercising our duties to legislate, oversee, and enforce the legal framework of anti-corruption. I encourage my fellow parliamentarians who are not yet a member to join our GOPEC and CEPEC membership and ensure that parliaments are engaged in all levels of anti-corruption efforts. As a final message, I call upon all the esteemed members of parliaments to collectively strengthen our commitment in combating uh, corruption. Do not let it lead our society to the decline of democracy. Thank you. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Uh, thank you, Pak Farli. The second remarks will be delivered through a video message by His Excellency Dr. Ali bin Fertais Almari, GOPAC Chair and also the Chair of the Internal and External Affairs Committee of the Shura Council of the State of Qatar. The message will be presented in Arabic and we are going to distribute the translation in English. بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم معالي الدكتور بوان مهراني رئيس مجلس النواب في جمهورية أندونيسيا حضرة الدكتور والصديق العزيز فضلي زون نائب رئيس المنظمة العالمية للبرلمانيين ضد الفساد ورئيس التحالف الاقتصادي والاجتماعي أصحاب السعادة الضيوف الكرام إن الحمد لله الذي جعل تحية الإسلام السلام فالسلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته اسمحوا لي أولا أن أهنيكم على تنظيم هذا المؤتمر واسمحوا لي بأن 
وأكد لكم بأن هذه المشاركة وبهذا الحجم من البرلمانيين تبين إلى حد بعيد التزام الجميع بمعالجة القلق الإقليمي بشأن قضايا الفساد والحوكمة يأتي اجتماعكم في التوقيت المناسب وذلك بسبب إن بعض البلدان في جنوب شرق آسيا قد أجرت بالفعل انتخابات وبعضها سيكون في المستقبل القريب سيدات والسادة التمويل السياسي هو قضية تمس صميم النشاط البرلماني تحتاج أي حملة أينما كانت إلى التمويل إلى المال وستكون كيفية كسب هذه الأموال واستخدامها أمرا حاسما في المسيرة السياسية وتمس صميم الحوكمة والعمل السياسي وكلما غابت عنها الشفافية ظهر الفساد بأبشع صورة يسعدني أن أركز معكم أيضا على قضية الفساد الأخضر والفساد الأخضر دون أن ندخل في تفاصيله كلكم تعلمون ما هو الفساد الأخضر الفساد الأخضر هو مناصرة الطبيعة والعمل على كل ما يمت إلى هذه الطبيعة بصلة ولكن بحكم حجم الأموال المهولة التي تصرف في هذه المشاريع فإننا نرى الفساد أيضا في أبشع صورة يمس حياة الإنسان يمس الأكسجين شريان الحياة للبشر وللكوكب وعندما يمس هذا الشريان فإن القادم سيكون أسوأ لذلك قضية الكنترول على هذه الأموال التي تصرف على قضايا المناخ هي الآن تعتبر من أهم وأخطر هذه القضايا والتي يجب أن يعمل العالم أجمع إلى التركيز عليها هناك أموال تضخ من خلال الدول مباشرة إلى القطاعات التي تعمل على قضايا المناخ وهناك أموال تضخ وهذا الأخطر من خلال منظمات دولية ابتداء من الأمم المتحدة إلى المنظمات الإقليمية كلها دون استثناء هذه الأموال إن لم تخضع إلى حوكمة دقيقة إن لم تخضع إلى مراقبة دقيقة من قبل الجميع فنعتقد بأن الأنفس المريضة وهم كثر ستطال أيديهم هذه الأموال وستكون النتائج عكسية عندما يدخل الفساد في أي مشروع فهو كفيل بتحطيمه أي ما كان كما ذكرنا قبل قليل فإن اجتماعكم يأتي في الوقت المناسب لأن اتفاقية الأمم المتحدة هي اليوم في عامها العشرين خلال عشرين عام هذه الاتفاقية عانت الكثير عانت من دول كانت تقف بالمرصاد لعدم إنجاح هذه الاتفاقية كان هناك دول كثر عملوا وأنا أذكر أنه اجتماع الدوحة كان برئاستي وبدعم كبير من الأصدقاء في كل مكان الحاضرين لكن هناك دول أيضا كانت تقاوم على كل تعديل بما فيها قضايا الحوكمة دول انتشر فيها الفساد وتريد أن تصدر هذا الفساد لم تكتفي بأن يكون الفساد فيها لذلك القضية الآن في هذا الوقت وبعد مرور عشرين عام على اتفاقية الأمم المتحدة أنا أعتقد أن الأمم المتحدة ونحن العاملين على قضايا محاربة الفساد أصبحنا على المحك الحقيقي أين نحن من الإعراب لذلك أنا أعتقد بأن مؤتمركم جاء في وقته لكن أنا أعتقد النتائج التي ستخرج من هذا المؤتمر في نظره هي أهم من المؤتمر ومن الاجتماع في حد ذاته نحن لا نجتمع من أجل الاجتماع نحن نجتمع للخروج 
بنتائج ايجابيه تساعد في تحجيم هذا الفساد، لن نستطيع ان نقضي على الفساد مهما اوتينا من قوه. لكن نستطيع ان نحارب الفساد. لذلك سيكون الحوار بمثابه اساسا لمواصله متابعه مشاركه الجميع في مؤتمر الدول الاطراف في اتفاقيه الامم المتحده وتعزيز قدرتنا على التنفيذ لافعال الاتفاقيه واحراز التقدم على المستوى الوطني. اشكر كل من ساهم في اعمال هذا المؤتمر في اندونيسيا الصديقه والحبيبه كان بودنا ان نكون معكم ولكن يقال في اللغه العربيه الحمد لله الذي جعل الاقلام تنوب عن الاقدام ولو لم تكن الاقدام الاقلام تنوب عن الاقدام لاضطررنا الى الذهاب اليكم والمشاركه معكم باشخاصنا ختاما يشرفني ان اقول كلمه استطعت ان اجدها في اللغه الاندونيسيه العزيزه علينا جميعا تريما كاسي شكرا Uh, ladies and gentlemen, we will now proceed to the main discussion of the meeting. The first session of the conference on addressing the root. The first session is the uh, on addressing the root of political corruption in Southeast Asia, Parliament's role in regulating and monitoring political finance. The session will consist of three presentations from our esteemed uh, panelists, followed by an open discussion, and it will be led by Honorable Vice Chair of the Committee for Interparliamentary Cooperation, uh, Mr. Putu Rudana. Pak Putu, silakan Pak mengambil tempat. Thank you. Yes. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you, Ibu Enda. Um, once again, uh, of course, uh, welcome to Indonesia, welcome to Jakarta, to all our distinguished uh, delegates, to all our speakers here, uh, important speakers. And then uh, hopefully everything goes well. And then as you know, the weather now, it's raining, but I think it's a blessing from God because after the last three years, it's been uh, COVID-19, right? So we cannot meet in person, but now luckily, uh, starting probably last year, we could have a discussion and meet in person. But uh, I think this is a great time to actually discuss about the topic today regarding, uh, of course, uh, about, um, uh, it's uh, about uh, corruption, green corruption, how to combat green corruption. And then, uh, first of all, uh, I would like to, uh, Dr. Fadilizon, the SIGPAC President, COPEC Vice President, uh, Honorable Member of Parliament, Excellency Ambassador, I, I saw it as uh, Ambassador from uh, Thailand is here also, uh, Honorable Panelists, Speakers, Ladies and Gentlemen, uh, once again, I would like to introduce myself. My name is Putu Supadma Rudana. I'm the Vice Chair of the Committee for Interparliamentary Cooperation. And uh, of course, uh, the duty of uh, the committee is uh, we always do uh, going uh, abroad to have a multilateral meeting uh, to strengthen bilateral cooperation between Indonesia and many other parliament from many countries. And then, of course, uh, I'm very delighted here uh, to actually welcome you in the first session uh, with the theme of uh, addressing the root of political corruption in Southeast Asia, Parliament's role in regulating and monitoring political finance. And of course, today uh, I will uh, serving as a moderator for this session. We have. Uh, we're supposed to have, I think, four speakers, but now we have three speakers. Uh, one speaker is through Zoom. Uh, it's uh, Professor Adam Graker. He's a professor of public policy and director of Tretton Institute, University of Adelaide, Australia. He was previously professor at the Australian National University when he established the Transnational Research Institute on Corruption. 
in 2021, he was the winner of the Global Anti-Corruption Excellence Award from the Rule of Law and Anti-Corruption Center, an organization founded also by the chair of GOPEC, Dr. Ali bin uh, Al Mari. Today, Prof. Uh, Graker is joining us virtually, like I told you, from Adelaide, Australia, who will explore about how to enhance transparency and accountability of political finance in Southeast Asia as one of the effort to tackle political corruption. Also, the second speaker will have uh, Dr. Bridget Wells, I hope I pronounced you correctly. She is Honorary Research Associate at the University of Nottingham, Asia Research Institute uh, in Malaysia. She is also a Senior Research Associate of the Hu Feng Center for East Asia Democratic Studies of National Taiwan University. She specializes in Southeast Asian politics with a focus of Malaysia, Myanmar, Singapore, and of course, Indonesia. Today, Dr. Wells will discuss about the impacts of political financing to the quality of democracy in Southeast Asia and how to strengthen Parliament's role in political finance reform and oversight. And uh, of course, this first session, last but not least, the Honorable Li Chen Chung is here. And uh, uh, the third uh, speaker, also uh, uh, his uh, Honorable Li Chen Chung is a member of Parliament MPs from uh, Malaysia. And then uh, it's, uh, I haven't met MPs from Malaysia a while because you have your election and congratulations you will hear because I think there's no delegation I think in IPA in Cambodia last time. Yes, so uh, we welcome you back again. And then IPA will be here in Indonesia, and then we welcome all the delegation from Malaysia again. Without uh, further ado, uh, I would like to kindly invite Professor Adam Graker uh, to take the floor as the first speaker. And then um, he will be through Zoom. And then uh, the time for each speaker is 15 minutes. Uh, probably uh, I give more. 15 to 20 minutes, because it used to be four speakers, now it's three speakers, and after that we will have intervention from the member of parliaments and also discussion and question. Please, and uh, first speaker, uh, Dr. Uh, Professor Adam Greker. Professor? Hello, can you hear me? Yes, of course. Uh, before I couldn't hear you, but now okay. clearly we can hear you. Please take the floor. Okay, and there's just one more thing. If for some reason the audio is not good, please interrupt me because sometimes on this computer we don't have good audio, but please interrupt me if you can't hear me. So I'm honoured, deeply honoured, to be invited to participate uh, with you today. Um, I'm sorry that I can't be here in person. It's a, I would love to be there with you in person. I've been working on corruption as director of our Transnational Research Institute on Corruption here in Australia. But one thing I am not arrogant enough to try and specify what sorts of things work best in your country. Uh, what I want to do today is not go blow by blow uh, how you might do better things, but rather to provide a framework for analysis so that you can apply these in your own situation. And the speakers that follow me will speak much more specifically. So what I want to do is really provide a backdrop uh, to help you enhance the way in which enhance the way in which you can start to deal with complex issues of uh, political financing electoral uh, funding now i believe uh, the, there are some slides somewhere so could you please show me the first slide Okay, and the next one, uh, that, <clears throat> so we'll move to the next slide. Uh, what we've got here, what we've got here are two dimensions. Uh, first of all, 
there's election funding. And then there we start to look at what do we get? <clears throat> when something is a donation, this is something that we always accept uh, quite normally in a democratic society, that people should be able to support ideas that uh, are in accordance with their ideology, with their values. But one thing I want you to note is that when that donation becomes a transaction, in other words, when it moves from general support to something uh, for which there is something in return, this is very often a bribe. Now, what we do have, uh, so we've got two processes. One is getting to the stage of legislation, and that is election funding. And uh, I wanted to say, and I'll talk about this later, we've done some work in Australia on uh, trying to promote free and fair election funding. But then we have a second dimension, which involves corrupt activity, sometimes in making the law and sometimes in implementing the law. When we have corruption in making the law, then we're dealing clearly with corruptions in our parliamentary processes. When we have corruption in implementing the law, that often relates to the bureaucracy. And sometimes the way in which you know, finance and donations create opportunities for people to make the law in the favour, in favour of vested interests, undermines transparency and accountability. In, when I teach students, I spend whole sessions on accountability and transparency and the understanding of those processes. But in 15 minutes, we're not going to do that. But what we've got when we start looking at corrupt activity, you know, in the making of the law and the implementation of the law, in making of the law, we're really talking about how corruption shapes public policy, in implementing the law, how it affects public policy. Next slide, please. Then, you know, what we need to think through is whether corruption is an isolated exception or whether it's the norm, whether it's just a transgression, an isolated incident, or whether it's part of the system. Uh, we like to think in Australia, for example, that corruption is always the exception, but in some of the countries that we have around the table, corruption is very much the norm. So you need different strategies when you're dealing with a system compared to when we're dealing with isolated transgressions. Next slide, please. And the next thing I wanted to get across. And this, uh, you might think, this all shapes the way in which we deal with corruption. Sometimes we have corruption with theft. You know, that involves, you know, not paying taxes, uh, mm, diverting funds, taxes that should go to government in areas, you know, we're talking green corruption later on, allowing logging of forests and not paying tax. But then we also have corruption without theft. And I want you to think about that, um, because what we have there, things like nepotism, things like uh, giving contracts to friends, family, and other places, there's no theft there because the contract would have to be given anyway. The job would have to be filled anyway. And so what uh, we try to do is to uh, make sure, to give a framework. Um, I try and to say, look, when I talk to my students, I always say two things you've got to remember. First of all, not all corruption is the same. You know, with theft, without theft, there are different types, different activities, many things. And then some places are more corrupt than others. Sometimes it might be a nation state more corrupt than others. Sometimes it might be one hospital is more corrupt than others, uh, than another, uh, one police station. So if we can go to the next slide, please. 
what I've done in my writing, and if I had uh, more time, I would spend a lot of time trying to take you through uh, a framework I've devised called TASP. Different types of corruption, different activities, different sectors, different places. Let me quickly go through them. Next slide, please. We can see there are many different types of corruption. Many people think bribery is uh, the main one, but no, that's only one part of it. If we look at, you know, across the top, abuse of discretion is another one, trading in influence, and this often affects uh, members of parliament, conflict of interest. So we've got to think of the different types of corruption. Okay, let's move to the next slide. We find that in different activities. You know, financing elections is one activity. Um, you know, hiring people, buying things, making things. And you'll see where I'm going with that. The next slide, please. Um, we find corruption in different sectors, uh, in fisheries, in timber, in climate change, in construction, in works and so on, and different places. Now, the reason I've gone through all of these is uh, at the next session, we're going to talk about green corruption, corruption in climate, corruption in fisheries, corruption in timber. And if we take an example, you know, types, if we think of bribery in uh, <clears throat> Nepotism, yeah, bribery in, hum in human resource hiring, which is an activity to regulate fisheries. So what we do, if we take these, we can then identify what the problem is. We can very specifically target in on how parliamentarians might be involved, bureaucrats might be involved. Or if we take another example, a different type of corruption, misuse of information in, say, administering in, say, timber uh, qu quotas. Or we might take a different type, self-dealing, that is, members of parliament uh, owning companies or having shareholders in companies um, that then they might exhort, extort as an activity uh, timber sales. So by doing the TASP analysis, we can then start to understand the point of intervention, you know, how elections admit, uh, affect the way we're dealing with it. Next slide, please. One of the important regulatory effects uh, comes in things like uh, timber. This is one very important environmental issue. And, you know, the World Bank, for example, uh, estimates that illegal logging costs about $1 trillion a year. Next slide, please. Um, you know, this is just a little bit of numbers. And uh, this is hugely political. It's not just a bureaucratic matter. And, you know, when you've got uh, timber interests being able to fund elections, when you have timber interests being able to help write legislation, to develop exemptions, to develop tax breaks and so on, uh, these are these all stem from some root of political financing. And that trillion dollars uh, with illicit timber ex you know, excludes the value of uh, the ecosystem, the communities, and so on. Next slide, please. Um, and so what we've got with the timber, uh, again, it's uh, financing, parliamentary interventions about quotas, development of uh, logging concessions, which are sometimes bureaucratic. And so it's finding the, that difference between it, uh, restrictions on timber exports, uh, which are sometimes uh, abused, often through different forms of bribery and through different forms of finance. Now, if we have the next uh, slide, uh, we're also talking about another uh, environmental issue, uh, and this is fisheries. Next slide, please. We can see that uh, global per capita fish consumption has increased dramatically. And this becomes a very significant international issue because the fish don't know international boundaries, 
But uh, we do have uh, fishing boats crossing international boundaries. We're talking about $130 billion a year. We're talking about small states not having the resources to be able to police it. We see soft diplomacy in some ways, uh, foreign aid uh, exchanged for fishing concessions. We see all sorts of difficulties. And uh, this leads, you know, when we know that something like um, 84 percent of the global population that's engaged in fisheries, both as employment and so on, they're in the Asia Pacific region. This is a huge issue for our region. And uh, fisheries and sustainability, when you've got unsustainable and corrupt fishing practices, there needs to be enormous regulation and parliamentary action, because otherwise it leads to climate change, environmental change, and so on. So we move everywhere from uh, low-level uh, officials uh, having gifts and small bribes through to high-level financial transactions, uh, parliamentary interference with legislation, ministerial interference in official processes. So what I want to, I mean, these are just some things that we're going to talk about in a little while, but if we can go to the next slide, please. Um, what I point out, the most important thing always to note is that uh, mm, corruption follows opportunity. And the parliaments play a very, very important role in structuring those opportunities. Um, and so when I talk to students, when I run training courses in other countries, when I do teaching at places like the International Anti-Corruption Academy in Vienna, we always start with uh, this point, corruption follows opportunity, to start to look at whose opportunity and uh, where are the breaking points. And when we start looking at uh, electoral financing and political financing, we see one set of opportunities. If we could have the next slide, please. Um, the opportunity structure that we have uh, comprises really three things. A motivated offender, we need, there is somebody who is likely to offend. A second point is a target. And the third point is the absence of some sort of capable guardianship. So if we look at the motivated offenders, most often we think of you know, small-scale bureaucrats who take bribes. But sometimes it's the principal. Sometimes it is a minister, a parliamentarian, who uses uh, opportunity. The target, the target might be, you know, if we talk fish, if we talk timber, but if we also talk parliament, you know, the target, uh, becomes uh, members of parliament and laws relating uh, to financing. And the guardianship, the guardianship involves two things. First, a compliance regime, but very often you have a lot of rules and people don't always follow those rules. And then sometimes some culture, the culture that realizes that we're doing this in an ethical and appropriate way. So what I want you to think about then is who might be an offender, what the targets might be, and how guardianship can play. Now, next slide, please. In Australia, and I also always talk about um, the big difference between corruption in rich countries and corruption in poor countries. We've uh, a team that I worked with, a couple of other professors, and uh, Transparency International. Two years ago, we wrote what we called a blueprint um, for Australia's national integrity system, a blueprint for action, because we also had slipped in the Global uh, Corruption Perceptions Index. And we've got five chapters in this report. And look, I'm very, as I said at the outset, it's not for me to tell you how to run things in your country, but if you'd like a, a copy of that report, my email is at the bottom of the slides. But you'll note that Section 4, Chapter 4 on this is called Fair 
honest democracy. And this does talk about um, some reforms in electoral financing, transparency, accountability, reporting in real time. Now, that's an Australian uh, thing. Now, if we go to the next slide and the final slide, um, there are various conventions and instruments globally. And uh, we've got these here, and they all come together. Uh, the moderator talked about the United Nations Convention Against Corruption. But there's also the United Nations Convention, the UNTOC, against transnational organized crime, because they do play a role in fisheries. They do play a role uh, in timber. They do play a role in areas such as uh, climate financing. And so the UNTOC is important. And then as we're going this afternoon to talk our next session about green corruption, uh, the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. So to finish off, what I really wanted to say was I've just tried to outline some things to think of to give you a framework as step one to better understanding the opportunities, the targets uh, in, uh, in political financing, and uh, we can then talk much more later about some of the uh, specific mechanisms. Thank you very much, Chair. Uh, thank you, Professor Greker. Um, of course, there's a one uh, point that I always remember, corruption follows opportunity. So I think there's uh, in all fields, uh, in all uh, places, so but how we combat this and then how hopefully and then uh, after this, uh, we will have uh, Dr. Bridget Wells next. And then uh, she's uh, doing a lot of research. Is that right, Dr. Wells? And then hopefully she will mention honestly about the position of ASEAN, how actually the index, but I don't know. She will uh, do the presentation in 15 minutes and then I will give the floor to her. Please, thank you. Putu, for your very kind invitation, introduction and for to the organizers for inviting me. Uh, when I arrived in Jakarta yesterday, it's been three years, my heart lifted, I felt a sense of joy of arriving back in Indonesia, despite the machet that was involved. <laughs> uh, so uh, it is indeed an honor. Um, can I have the, sp the organizers put up the slide? Uh, and I'm going to try to speak to about 15 minutes uh, uh, and begin a conversation. Um, I want to begin my conversation before the slides with a little story. This is a story of a man called Amir. I met him in Sabak Burnam, which is a place in Selangor outside of Malaysia during the elections last year and the parliament elections in November of last year. And Amir told me he had received a hundred ringgit, which is about 400,000 rupiah as a, uh, for his vote uh, uh, and to vote for a particular coalition. And I asked him how he felt about this. And he said, you know, he said, I'm voting against corruption. I said, okay, okay. And you sort of that, but do it, but you get you vote against the corruption. And I said, and he said that he felt that uh, it was necessary for him to receive these funds. And of course, later in my conversations with Amir, who was pumping my petrol, actually, uh, mm -hmm. he explained how the difficulties his family faced during the COVID time, the yeah. issues of survival, the issues and challenges that he faces as a young person, he was 20 years old, about his future. And why do I start this conversation with the story of Amir? Is because these issues are complex. They're not so simple. Right? They're not as black and white as we think it is. And I think we have to be cognizant of that as scholars, as practitioners, uh, as people who are representing different actors in this storylines, how complicated it is. And to understand that when someone takes money, uh, they're doing it for their family. <laughs> Uh, in this, and that, and sometimes the systematic issues are very difficult to address. My main point of my presentation will be that in order to address these issues of corruption, to deal with issues of political financing, you need an ecosystem. Parliamentarians are part of that, but it needs to be a broader ecosystem. To address the problems of Amir, you need to address the problems of social mobility, poverty, and inequality in a society. And in order to do that, that's not just a political finance bill. 
It needs to have policies and other issues in terms of parliamentarians. So I ask you as parliamentarians to be cognizant of these interrelationships and complexity. But now I turn to my presentation, where I hope I will try to illustrate some of the questions I was asked. Uh, and if, as always, one begins with an apology uh, for recognizing there may be shortcomings in only 15 minutes. But I'll begin as we discuss broad issues at bay. Sila, the next slide. Thank you. What we've learned in the context of, of studying corruption and studying the issues of governance in Southeast Asia is that we have seen a pattern where democracy has had an un, uh, uneven impact of cor on reducing corruption. The idea was that places that would have more democratic governance would actually reduce corruption. Indonesia is illustrative of the uneven impact on corruption, but there are many other countries in the region that show that. At the same time, we also know that greater authoritarianism has increased corruption. We only need to look at the horrible circumstances in Myanmar to understand that the impact of what happens when we have greater authoritarianism. So the answers don't just lie with the different regimes of democracy or authoritarianism. As we all know as practitioners and policymakers, the devil is in the detail, the policies, the things that you can put in place to create this ecosystem. In particular, I highlight the need for a greater ecosystem because of the impact of the crisis of COVID. I think the region as a whole is encouraging in voters to, to adopt issues of short-term survival strategies. This is why the need for political financing and bills needs to be carefully put together as part of an ecosystem. Sila, next slide, please. This one is just, Putu just asked me to show what uh, uh, Dr. Fadli was just saying about the trends of the recent transparency indices. These are the numbers for the last year. We know that in Southeast Asia, the numbers have been going down in terms of not performance. Uh, and that, but keep in mind that these indications about corruption are often done by business elites in, in Transparency International. And so they, are, they reflect a particular perspective. But I point to troubling indications in places like Cambodia, uh, Thailand, uh, and of course, Indonesia. Malaysia has had modest gains, but backtracking in the last few years. My, my neighbor to my right will speak more about Malaysia. He's asked me not to talk much about Malaysia, so I only talk about Malaysia and Amir Saja. And then we will see. Um, but of course, Singapore, I think its score is over, over inflated, but we can discuss that later. <laughs> the next slide. Um, I wanted to bring also to the conversation, since I was helping to set the context, this is the Asia Barometer Survey, which I'm a core member. And this data shows you something very interesting, is that while corruption indicators may vary across the country, they also vary, what people perceive in Southeast Asian countries is corruption there is very different. Helping someone to go into a school is not necessarily corruption. Although maybe people, in fact, it may be corruption, but it's perceived very differently. And we have very polarized views about how corruption uh, is, is widespread or not. And this gives you some of the, these are data that is done in the last two years. So it gives you some of the indicators of survey research. The next slide. We also have very different views of how effective corruption has been the responses. Indonesia gets a poor rating in terms of effectiveness, comparatively speaking, but some of the other countries get even much worse in terms of their numbers. Uh, but what we see is a situation where, as with what people see as corruption, how they see their government dealing with corruption is actually very different. So, and this is again to the complexities that we're trying to understand. Next slide, please. Someone like myself who studies elections knows that elections are at the core of what, at the center of all of the corruption. Campaign and candidates and parliamentarians need money in order to campaign. And they need even more money because campaigns are costing even more than they used to before. The prices go up, not just for the barang in the grocery stores, but also for running campaigns in this context. We have seen a tremendous amount of fascinating and, and a wonderful scholarship by scholars looking at clientelism and corruption in Southeast Asia. And time doesn't give me enough time to discuss some of that, but I want to point to some of the kind of features 
that to set the context for my recommendations in a moment about the ecosystem. We see that the issues of clientelism and patronage and corruption are intertwined. They evolve social relationships, transactions, brokers, networks, and unequal reciprocity. What does that mean? That means it is very deeply embedded to people like Amir all the way to the prime ministers of countries. We see a situation where there are very different forms of corruption and patronage uh, that are tied to election. Positions, uh, who's going to get different appointments, contracts, and the subcontracts that come from that. Political donations, bribery as being a key element of that. Vote buying is a vote only worth $25 or 4,000, 400,000 rupiah. It's quite expensive, some people would say. Some people would say it's not enough. <laughs> vote buying. Welfare programs are used and misused as part of the campaign in these areas. Who gets to distribute it and how? The timing of how they're distributed. You can see these in these areas very meaningfully. I'm not doing a, dis a service to the richness of scholarship by Ed Aspinall, Paul Hutchcroft, and others that I want to emphasize, and many inter uh, interesting work on Indonesia. But there are some broader trends what the literature tells us about us, these issues in Southeast Asia. We see party-based patronage and clientelism has moved to parties relying on the state and state-based. That means they rely more heavily on using government programs in order to win and woo voters. And they continue to use their powers and positions, but they don't use the party as the way to distribute those funds to the same degree as before. We also see a situation where many of the local dynamics of corruption and patronage on elections have moved to the local area, where we have local mafias uh, who have become very powerful through this decentralization process. And this, of course, I will speak about the effects in a moment, but it has a particular impact on, re on increasing inequality. We see the reemergence of new forms of clientelistic patterns. Keep in mind, corruption is like, and patronage and clientelism are like a doughboy. You push them down somewhere, they come up somewhere else in a different form. It's a bit of a cancer and a monster that exists. <laughs> no matter how much you go through the process of treatment, huh? they still is a resurgence. So this is why the battle for dealing with these issues is constantly uh, a challenge. Equally important, we see a trend where now or countries are relying more heavily on using funds, not just domestically, but international vehicles. They're becoming part of financial crimes. One MDB is an illustration of that in this context. So it's not just uh, a domestic factor of being a bribe. It's a, it becomes part of a larger financial network. Next slide, please. I was asked to do two things. One is to talk about what is the impact of these patterns on the quality of democracy in Southeast Asia, and two, what can parliamentaries do, parliamentarians do? Let me begin to answer the first question. We, the research teaches us very important practice, impacts. The first of which is that these patterns systematically increase inequality, and they in turn also feed more corruption. We have seen that corruption and patronage has reinforced elite and oligarchic rule. It has empowered key political families. There are books now on the key families in Thailand and the Philippines. We can do the same ones in Indonesia also. <laughs> Malaysia as well. The oligarchy, part, it's reducing political competition. We see a situation where we have the business politics nexus has, recome, has come back in a, hard, in a significant form. Uh, and this, of course, limits the ability for individuals to, uh, to have a competitive economy. Indonesia has been very progressive compared to some of the other countries, but we do have a real challenge in the fact that those who have money continue to make money and those who don't have money continue not to get money in this process that it is systemic effects of the impact of these patterns. And of course, we have tremendous leakages and waste. Next slide, please. Corruption, patronage, and others has impacted in various ways 
and uh, the nature of political campaigns. Foremost, they have raised the cost of campaigning. It has also made elections about a utilitarian view. So as, rather than a focus on broader issues and principles, and principles, the focus is very much on what is in it for me, and what can I get from this election? Very short-term thinking. We have also systematically see across surveys, greater distrust in, pol in politicians and political institutions. There is an anger among many parts of the electorate in Southeast Asia, especially those that are more economically disadvantaged. The impact of these practices also makes the campaign process focused on short term elections, which that means that policies and policy making and solutions to the countries that ordinary people face and the, and the problems that people face have become less viable. Because everyone says, what can I get for myself? As opposed to what can I do to solve the problems longer <clears throat> term? Things, there is this kind of vicious cycle that people focus only on being reelected, <laughs> as opposed to focusing on what they should do once they are reelected. And we can see this systematically throughout these processes. Equally so, the narratives become a zero sum. It's either I win and get money and the other person doesn't. And it feeds the polarization, the values that underscore and decline and de erode the practices of democratic governance. Next slide, please. We've also seen this systematically through repeated studies, bought local governments, and it's sometimes on national policies. We've had, as many of the colleagues will speak with much better clarity than I am on the issues of green corruption, we can see tremendous impact on negative impact on climate and climate change and land development at the local level. And we have led, this has led to also spillovers where media and civil society have been targeted for raising issues of corruption because they are seen to be challenging the system. The system remains a lack of transparency. That's the answer, the preliminary answer to the first question. Let me turn in my last minute or so to the questions and lessons so far and what we can think about what the literature is telling us and the experience is telling us from a perspective of what parliamentarians can do. We know there have been serious impacts on democratic governance. But as practitioners and policymakers and academics, we need to be responsible to see the interconnections to recognize that political financing alone is not only the solution, that it has to be done in tandem with other particular measures. We can see and learn from the lesson of Thailand where they introduced new political financing and created new subsidies that with a matter of time, the system brought back a more authoritarian government that rejected these practices. We can see that we need to reframe the lessons that we've had and think more carefully about what those lessons have been. Crucial is being, bringing buy-in to the system. Parliamentarians and elites do not want to change the system unless they can see a reason to do so. They have to be given a reason to do so. The main reason for them to reduce and change is, is for them to save money for themselves, to reduce the campaign mm -hmm. costs. costs. <laughs> this is the most one of most traction, but many other people in the room may have others to offer <laughs> in this area. Uh, but also the other reasons that are more impactful are the needs to reduce inequality, to embrace better policies, to make better governance. Now let's turn to the last slide and what parliamentarians can do, and I will close my remarks. Political funding bill is essential in many countries throughout Southeast Asia, but it's not enough. And the devil is in the detail of that bill. Keep in mind, uh, bills often favor those in power, not necessarily favor those who want to challenge those in power. Yes, strengthening oversight is essential, but important in that oversight is strengthening oversight over parliamentarians themselves and the business elites that they work with. Equally important is that Parliament needs to be given much more legitimacy 
and being the body of oversight. The anti-corruption body in Malaysia, which my colleague, my friend, uh, YB Lee will speak about, reports to the executive, not to the parliament. That should change. Election commissions should report to the parliament, not to the executive, like in Singapore. They should report to the parliament, not to be a part of the prime minister's office. These shifts in terms of making institution building are very important, more equitable, more checks and balances. There needs to be greater oversight over local government. The conditions that are happening in local communities, especially over land development and climate, have broader national implications, but they have significant implications on people like Amir, who can't find a job, who's facing floods in his kawasan, in his area, in his kampo. Equally important, we have to have organizations like this, like CPAC, we help to build like-minded allies. The allies you think are not your friends have to become your friends. In politics, many in the room know your enemies become your friends. Your friends become your enemy. In order for a bill and changes on these areas, you need to figure out how to create broader rubric of allies and continue your engagement. Terima kasih banyak. I've spoken enough. I'm sure that there are others that will have others to say. Uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Bridget Wells. And now uh, the third speaker, Honorable Li Chen Chung. Uh, I haven't mentioned about the CV, but I will explain a bit about uh, Honorable Li Chen Chung. Uh, he's a member of uh, Malaysian House of Representatives from Petaling Jaya Constituent. And then he's a member of the People Justice Party, a component of the Pakatan Harapan Coalition. He holds Master in Public Administration from uh, Lee Kuan Yew School of Public Policy and U.S. in Singapore. Recently, in 2022, he established a mutual health group that empowers and assists victims of scamming and financial frauds. Today, Honorable Chung will uh, share us about Malaysia's experience in regulating political finance. It's actually a very fresh situation. You just have your election less than a few months ago. Yes, and then, uh, so very fresh experience. And then now, without further ado, I give you the time of 15 minutes also, please. Uh, thank you, Mr. Moderator. Uh, it's been honored to speak to um, like-minded member of parliaments, scholars, uh, as well as uh, the staff uh, of uh, GOPAC and also CPAC. It's always challenging to speak after Dr. Bridget Welsh because uh, she understands Malaysia as much as I do. <laughs> but fortunately, uh, she brought this perspective broader from Southeast Asia perspective. And um, I'm going to share with you the overview of uh, Malaysia's approach in political financing and how do we fight corruption. Well, ladies and gentlemen, uh, policy, legislative and institutional reforms are key for effective anti-corruption initiative. Malaysia will ensure efforts are being implemented in line with the Article 5 of the United Nations Convention Against Corruption, which aims to protect the rights of the people, to stop leakages of public funds, as well as to spur economic growth. In addressing the issues of integrity and governance, which pose common risks to corruption, Malaysia has launched the National Anti-Corruption Plan, a robust yet holistic plan, which outlines integrated cost of action and key initiatives in fighting corruption in Malaysia. It's launched in January 2019, short after we experienced the first change of government after 60 years. So the plan, the plan aims at eliminating abuse of power, putting a stop to political interference, as well as eliminating embezzlement and mismanagement. The NACP, National Anti-Corruption Plan, outlined six strategies as follows. First, strengthening political integrity and accountability. Second, strengthening the effectiveness of public service delivery. We believe that when we become more lean and more effective, there will be less rooms for corruption. Third, 
increasing the efficiency and transparency in public procurement. I'll speak later on um, in recent bu budget speech, we have promised also to, I mean, the prime, newly elected Prime Minister promised to enact a uh, public procurement act, which would be helpful in uh, increasing the transparency in public procurement. Fourth, enhancing the credibility of legal and judicial system. Fifth, institutionalizing credibility of law enforcement agencies. And last but not least, inculcating good governance in corporate entity. One of, one of the key initiatives that has been emphasized under the NACP plan is strengthening the political governance by introducing a new law to regulate the political financing through institutional and legislative reforms. However, there are some gaps and challenges faced in Malaysia. Ladies and gentlemen, currently there is no provisions of laws or legislative framework that regulates political financing in Malaysia. The current laws only monitor the expenditure of election candidates during the official campaigning period between nomination day and polling day under the Election Offences Act 1954. Meanwhile, the provision under the Society Act 1966 only set requirement to each political party to submit the annual expenditure statement and source of funds received to the Registrar of Societies Malaysia, which is under the Executive uh, Ministry of uh, Local Affairs, Domestic Affairs, which with lack of capacity on enforcement. Therefore, there is a need to strengthen the control and monitoring mechanism on the political parties and candidates' activities with regards to political financing by centralizing regulations, monitoring of compliance and enforcement. Efforts have been continued to introduce a new legislation on governing political funding. As outlined among 115 initiatives under the NACP, which I've just mentioned just now. Uh, on 19 May last year, the former Prime Minister announced that the Special Cabinet Committee on Anti-Corruption had agreed in principle to a political funding bill. Former Law Minister Datuk Sri Dr. Wan Junaidi also planned to table the political financing bill in October 2022. But not realized, however, uh, due to some bills need to be refined first. And then, as we all know, the parliament dissolved, and now we have a new government. So the new government was elected in November 2022. It was led by uh, the Coalition of Hope, or Pakatan Harapan, alongside one of the longest establishment, uh, Amno and Barisa National, and the Borneo Blocks. So the PH election offering or manifesto pledge to regulate political financing and to enact political financing act. So as the newly elected uh, Prime Minister, uh, Datuk Sri Anwar Ibrahim, he has the track record of championing transparency and good governance and to fight against corruption. In his recent speech just last Friday, he mentioned that, uh, I mean, the words corruption appear in his text nine times. He also mentioned that corrupted practices has become systemic in Malaysia and reached a stage of affecting the government's administration and tainted the image of the nation. Then he announced that the Whistleblower Act will be amended so that the anti-corruption efforts will bear fruits. For your information, ladies and gentlemen, the Parliament of Malaysia has also made a set declaration of all MPs mandatory since 2019. At party levels, my party, uh, People Justice Party, is the first party in Malaysia that made a set declaration of candidates uh, mandatory, as witnessed in the recent election in November last year. Well, you can still check on the website uh, and you will know how poor I am. <laughs> so prior to the 2018, there were only five permanent and two temporary committees, select committees, uh, that had been in operation. Currently, the select committees was expanded to 10 departmental select committees and five topical select committees. Okay. Thereon, apart from the more independent parliamentary account committee, PAC, 
which by convention now should be chaired by the opposition, PSCs or parliamentary select committees also started to play a more prominent role in the check and balance and scrutinizing the executive power. The PSCs related to our topic today include PSC on integrity and anti-corruption, as well as a caucus on reform and governance, who was led by then the opposition leader and now PM. Going forward, I would like to quote uh, a paper titled Financing Politics in Malaysia, Reforming the System, on their recommendations that apart from new laws governing political parties, there is a need to consider two additional points, namely institutional reforms of agencies rep responsible for monitoring the activities of parties and elections and measures to ensure internal party elections as conducted in a manner devoid of deep monetization. I totally agree with what Dr. Bridget Welsh uh, mentioned just now. We need to tackle the whole ecosystem and not just uh, the part and parcel of it. So I am also the former Treasurer General of the current ruling party. I can testify that a multi-pronged approach is greatly needed to tackle the issues of monetization of politics. The voice of an MP who attains a certain social status in our respective area, country, uh, as well as an important figure in our own political party should play a more proactive role in legislative reform, institutional reform, as well as internal party election reform. So I would like to end here and I welcome your comments and feedback later. Thank you very much. Thank you, uh, Honorable Li Chen Chung. Um, uh, before I continue with the discussion also uh, from the Member of Parliament, uh, I will uh, summarize a little bit on uh, what has been uh, explained and then on the speech from uh, Professor Adam Greker. Election funding has the potential of corruption, especially those coming from donation and transaction. Therefore, an effort to ensure accountability and transparency is very important. Corruption is a multi-sector multi problem. It does not only involve those at the policy-making level, but also various sectors such as environment, fishery, and etc. Third, corruption follows opportunity, and this will be based on the motivated offender target and lack of capable guardian. Those parliaments have a critical role to ensure that the legislation are able to address this situation. Uh, on the speech of, from uh, Dr. Bridget Wells, I can summarize, in order to fight and address all of the challenges, the fight against corruption, we need to an ecosystem, an ecosystem that could guarantee all sectors perform their function and parliaments are one of the most important actors to play an active role through its lawmaking function. Elections are at the core of corruption. This involves social interaction and in our society, including clientelism, food buying, bribery, and etc. Business politic nexus are on the rise, which bring the oligarch system in is getting stronger. Political corruption has indeed influenced the extent to which democratic governance is effective or not. Thus, we need to address all of this problem together, especially Parliament, through the lawmaking oversight, both to parliaments and business involved in the political finance and ensure check and balances are present. And from the last speaker, in order to ensure our fight against corruption, it is important to strengthen the control and monitoring political finance in all political processes, including through the effective judicial system for ensuring good governance. In Malaysia's experience, there was a trend that corruption becomes systematic. Now, of course, Malaysia Parliament has established a parliament body in charge of ensuring institutional reform to tackle the whole ecosystem need needed for the anti-corruption efforts. Legislative reform is very critical. And then, of course, Honorable Lee Chen Chung 
has an experience as the treasurer for the party. So he knows the, the problem, and I think we should work together, and parliament should do more action to combat the corruption. And of course, now uh, I will give uh, the time to, to invite the representative from the parliament uh, to give the interventions. There I have, uh, there's four interventions. First one is from Thailand, second one is from Timor-Leste, third one is from Malaysia, and last one from Indonesia. Now I give the time to uh, Thailand. Thailand, who will address the intervention, please? The time is sure. Lien, Tan Patan, Tan Pu Tan, Pu Mikiat, Supa Purut, La, Supa Purti, Tukan Kap, Okapun T, Dipak, Dai, Chen, Kana, Pu Tan, Lassapa Thai, Okapun Tan Patan, Dipak, La, Sama Chik Sapa, Pu Tan, Rasadon Kong, อัธรรัตน์อินโดนีเซียเป็นอย่างยิ่งสําหรับอันเป็นเจ้าภาพจัดประชุมนี้ขึ้นเมื่อพิปรายในหัวข้อที่สําคัญและสําหรับการต้อ
นอกจากนี้ในส่วนของการออกกฎหมายซึ่งกฎหมายสําคัญเช่นกฎหมายปฏิรูปประเทศยังมีกลไกในรัฐธรรมนูญที่ออกให้วุฒิสภามีสิทธิที่จะมาโหวตตั้งแต่ต้นนั่นก็ทําให้กฎหมายบิ่นเบินในการที่จะไม่สามารถตรวจสอบการทุจริตของรัฐบาลได้เลยทําให้ปัญหาการทุจริตของประเทศไทยในขณะนี้ค่อนข้างจะรุนแรงเป็นอย่างยิ่งนี่คือสิ่งที่ตัวผมเองเป็นตัวแทนของพรรคฝ่ายค้านและตัวแทนของคนไกลที่อยากจะเปลี่ยนแปลงระบบนี้อย่างที่ท่านหลายท่านวิทยากรหลายท่านได้พูดขึ้นมาเราก็อยากเป็นอย่างนั้นและก็ตรวจสอบในหลายย่อยขอเรียนอีกประเด็นหนึ่งก็คือในเรื่องของหลังจากที่เราไม่สามารถตรวจสอบในส่วนของอการไทยรัฐได้ทําให้ทุกสิ่งทุกอย่างเวลามีการร้องเรียนมีการตรวจสอบก็จะเป็นเรื่องที่ไม่ถูกตรวจสอบในเวลาที่ควรจะเป็นและทำให้ปัญหาทุจริตของเรามืดบนประเด็นถัดมาเมื่อการที่สมาชิกวุฒิสภาเป็นจากการแต่งตั้งเข้ามาเลือกตั้งในวงตีเป็นการเบี่ยงเบนเสียงของประชาชนแล้วเนี่ยมันก็ทำให้ประชาชนนั้นหมดหวังกับการที่จะ,ะเสนอตัวแทนเข้าไปประมาณเดือนพฤษภาปีนี้นะครับอีกประมาณสามเดือนจะมีการเลือกตั้งสมาชิกสภาผู้แทนราษฎรของประเทศไทยผมในส่วนหน้าของฝ่ายค้านและเป็นตัวแทนพรรคเก้าไกลก็จะส่งและเสนอประเด็นของการแก้ไขการทุจริตคอร์รัปชันเหล่านี้เราเสนอการแก้ไขรัฐนูนเพื่อให้เป็นประชาธิปไตยอย่างแท้จริงเพื่อเอาอำนาจที่ประชาชนนั้นออกไปและให้เป็นประชาธิปไตยอย่างแท้จริงเราจะดําเนินตรงนี้เนี่ยนะฝ่ายค้านและเชื่อว่าประชาชนจะยอมรับเราประเด็นถัดมาที่อยากจะเรียนกับในส่วนของพี่น้องชาวอาเซียนก็คือรัฐบาลที่เปิดเผยสําหรับประเทศไทยเนี่ยมันมีมายาคติของสังคมไทยว่าการแก้ทุจริตต้องให้คนดีมาปกครองบ้านเมืองคืออาศัยตัวบุคคลซึ่งเป็นมายาคติมานานมากแต่ว่าในความเป็นจริงแล้วไม่ใช่เลยในความเป็นจริงจะต้องทําให้ข้อมูลของรัฐเนี่ยจํานวนมากได้รับการเปิดเผยให้ประชาชนเข้าถึงเพื่อตรวจสอบการทํางานภาครัฐได้ซึ่งของเรานั้นปิดค่อนข้างเยอะเมื่อไม่เปิดเผยการจะทำอะไรที่ไม่ถูกต้องสามารถทำได้ตรงนี้เป็นสิ่งสำคัญที่สุดเราคิดว่าเราควรจะต้องมีการแก้ไขให้เป็นรัฐเปิดเผยท่านสภามาจากประชาธิปไตยจริงๆแล้วเราจะต้องแก้ไขตรงนี้นี่คือในสิ่งของสภาผู้แทนราษฎรที่ในสมัยหน้าเราจะทำอาการที่สองคือข้อมูลที่รัฐเปิดเผยนั้นชะล่าช้าและไม่ได้ทำรูปแบบที่สามารถนามาประเมินประมวลผลและใช้ต่อตรวจสอบได้สะดวกเช่นเปิดเผยเป็น PDF หรือรูปภาพแทนที่จะเป็นรูปแบบ Machine Readable หรือ Excel ซึ่งตรงนี้เราคิดว่าถ้าทำแบบนี้ได้ประชาชนจะเข้าถึงได้ง่ายข้อมูลที่เปิดเผยล่าช้าและที่สำคัญคือหน่วยงานภาครัฐโดยเฉพาะรัฐที่ตรวจสอบยากแล้วไม่ยอมเปิดเผยสัญญาที่ทำแก่เอกชนทำให้การตรวจสอบเอื้อประโยชน์กับกลุ่มทุนผูกขาดได้มากนั่นคือสร้างความเหลื่อมล้าได้อีกและที่สำคัญอีกประการหนึ่งก็คือหน่วยงานของภาครัฐจะต้องอ้างบอกว่าข้อมูลนั้นเป็นข้อมูลลับจะต้องเก็บไว้ก่อนถ้าสิ่งเหล่านี้มีการเปิดให้เป็นข้อมูลมีการออกกฎหมายให้เปิดเผยและก็มีระบบจูงใจนะครับในทางกฎหมายให้จับผิดคนทุจริตได้เช่นยกตัวอย่างเช่นนะครับตรงนี้คือกฎหมายการมอบตัวก่อนการลดโทษให้กฎหมายคุ้มครองพยานที่ยังไม่เพียงพอนะครับตัวอย่างเช่นการทุจริตจะไม่ใช่เป็นคนคนเดียวนะครับจะเป็นหลายคนถ้าใครสามารถมอบตัวก่อนคนนั้นได้รับการลบโทษตรงนี้จะทําให้คนที่ร่วมกันทุจริตเนี่ยเกิดการสั่นคลอนได้ง่ายและเราแวงกันเองจะทําให้เปิดเผยได้กฎหมายตรงนี้เราจะต้อง Honorable t e r a c h a you can conclude your intervention please okay. ครับได้ครับแล้วก็เราต้องให้รางวัลแก่ประชาชนที่แจ้งเบาะแสทุจริตให้ด้วยในส่วนนี้ที่สำคัญเราต้องมีการปรับปรุงในส่วนของคณะกรรมการตรวจสอบให้ให้ปปชให้ทำงานอย่างเป็นกลางและประชาชนอย่างแท้จริงนี่คือสิ่งที่ในฐานะของผมซึ่งเป็นตัวแทนรัฐสภาในฐานะฝ่ายค้านเราคิดว่าเราก็จะทำในภูมิภาคอาเซียนคือประเทศไทยเราต้องสร้างให้ในการเลือกตั้งข้างหน้าและเชื่อว่าเราน่าจะแก้ไขทุจริตไปด้วยกันในภูมิภาคอาเซียนและในโอเพกนะครับที่ที่ที่มาร่วมกันในทุกประเทศเราเชื่อว่าเราจะทำได้และแก้ไขทุจริตคอร์รัปชันไปด้วยกันครับ
thank you. I think it's a very important intervention. First, um, it's very honest, and then you're from opposition, Honorable Tirachai Putun Pun Tunas. Is that? I hope I pronounce your name correctly. Um, Please, for the, there's three more intervention. Uh, if I could, I would like to ask you to make it brief, uh, because I think we started late, and then we have until 11:15. I was told by the organizer, so uh, I give the floor now to Timor Leste. Timor Leste, please. Thank you very much, Honorable Chairman of the. Mr. Fadlizon, member of parliament and participant. I think uh, this is a very good opportunity for us, uh, sharing and learning lesson about how to combat the corruption in our country. Thank you also to speakers, four, four, four or five speakers. They already say a very important thoughts and also mechanism issues that we should uh, see together in the future. Uh, Timor Leste, as you know, that a new nation, we are in the process of uh, consolidating, uh, establishing institution and also uh, many things that we should do, namely uh legislation and of course this in you know, the practice is corrupt, corrupt uh, corruption are also there however we are in the process of uh, having uh, uh, laws to regulate those practices practices we have actually uh as past eight laws and five degree law which uh, reflected the measure and the prevent and combat corruption, the focus on uh, different areas as revision of the statute of the prosecution office and the statute of judicial and magist uh, magistrate is criminal investigation organization, mining code, electoral administration bodies in the national and municipal level, local power and the decentralization administrative and judicial organization reform, uh, legal regime for procurement, public contract and respective infractions, general basis of the organization of public administration, the review of the national planning agency, monitoring and evaluation, and the establishment of the commission to fight against human trafficking and participation of the civil society and social audit. Um, on our um, anti-corruption law, we also regulate uh, about asset declaration. Uh, that's why I would like also to know more uh, uh, lesson from uh, my colleague speaker from Malaysia about asset declaration. In our country, uh, it's an obligation for you know, declaring an asset, starting from uh, president till the chief of the department. So all people you know, uh, should declare their asset and uh, submit to the Supreme Court. Uh, this is in the process, but it, it is, uh, I think it is uh, important to ask to a company as well expert from uh, uh, this forum also if we, we are welcome you to accompany us how to implement this you know uh, law so that we can improve uh, uh, in the future uh, so i would like to know from malaysia in what level you uh, regulate or in what, what level the, 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 the you know uh, you know declaration asset declaration should apply whether uh, 
just in the level of the in a politician, a minister, or a member of parliament, or but so that you can maybe you can share it also with us. Uh, um, I would like also uh, uh, to get a uh, how, how to call it uh, materials. The, the speaker just presented to us. Maybe we can bring it with, with us to our country so that we can also learn. Uh, I think uh, GOPAC is very important, CPAC. This forum is very important, so we do hope that uh, in the future we can uh, share and also share our, our practices, uh, the, share the, the issues that we uh, have. Uh, we have actually uh, a lot of practices. I would like to know more also about this, you know, uh, corruption, uh, particularly uh, in the ele election, because we'll have an election, we'll have a campaign uh, next, uh, 19 of uh, April, and then we'll have election in 21st May this, this year. So that's why uh, we would like also to see more about to monitor how the you know practices you know, corruption can apply also in this you know election next coming election. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Do you have okay. Sure. Uh, and next uh, from Malaysia. Thank you. Hello, Mr. Chairman and Mr. Moderator. As for Malaysia, the, the new government identified that major corruption for political financing comes from public procurement. And tackle this issue, our PM, our Prime Minister, in his budget speech, will introduce public procurement laws, as mentioned by my colleague, Honor Lee, just now. And our Prime Minister also stressed that all government procurement must go for open tender, meaning no more direct negotiation project, which had been identified is the most channel exposed to the corruption, whether for public service officers or politicians, and uh, members of the executive or MP or politician. Anyway, our Prime Minister, Pak Anwar, has said has started this corruption busting campaign, which we hope will reverse the culture of corruption in Malaysia. Thank you. Okay, thank you, uh, Honorable On Abu Bakar. And now, uh, Indonesia, this time is you. Terima kasih yang terhormat Pak Ketua dan Moderator. Terima kasih atas kesempatan yang diberikan kepada saya. Salah satu masalah utama dalam pengaturan dana kampanye dalam pemilu adalah keterbatasan sumbangan dana kampanye. Di Indonesia, batasan donasi dana kampanye hanya berlaku untuk pihak ketiga, yaitu perorangan dan badan usaha swasta. Kita punya undang-undang nomor 7 tahun 2017 tentang pemilihan umum yang mengatur batasan sumbangan kampanye selama masa pemilihan. Sementara sumbangan untuk dana kampanye bersumber dari caleg itu sendiri dan para pihak tidak dikenakan batas maksimum iuran. Hasilnya, caleg atau partai politik yang memiliki sumber dana besar bisa memaksimalkan kemampuan keuangan untuk membiayai berbagai kegiatan kampanye. Sedangkan partai dan caleg yang tidak memiliki sumber dana memiliki keterbatasan. Dalam melakukan kegiatan kampanye, jadi ada ketimpangan dalam kampanye proses. Dalam, dalam hal ini, seorang kandidat kita selalu dihadapkan oleh peristiwa-peristiwa yang ada di lapangan, yang mana dalam kandidat ini diperuntukkan untuk selalu e, memperjuangkan dia harus mewakili daerahnya dan mewakili yang telah diucapkan. Saya ingin bertanya kepada panelis, apakah ada rumusan mekanisme terbuka untuk menghitung batas donasi politik sehingga gap 
antar caleg tidak saling menghakimi dan tidak saling uh, membuat uh, apa namanya uh, perlakuan yang tidak baik di lapangan dan bisa dikurangi hal-hal yang seperti ini. Terima kasih. Uh, thank you, Honorable Ina Amania. And then um, this one is the last uh, intervention I will give to the Secretary, Secretary General of IPA. Maybe you should introduce yourself. This is brand new. This is a very <laughs> the new IPA Secretary General. Please, the floor is yours. Thank you so much. Um, uh, Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. And a very good morning to everyone. Um, yes, it is indeed. Um, I'm, I'm the new SecGen for the ASEAN Interparliamentary Assembly, and I've just started the well, just start office less than two months ago. Um, it is such a great honor. This is one of my first event to actually attend, and thank you to CPAC for inviting us. Um, so, just a little bit of, I guess, introduction with regards to IPA for those who actually. Um, are not aware or have just heard about it. So we are the sole parliamentary organization that is associated with ASEAN under the Annex 2 of the ASEAN Charter. And um, we aim to, in terms of encouragement and understanding, promote closer cooperation and close relations among the members of the parliaments in ASEAN member states, um, including our 20 observing countries currently that we actually have um, and, um, uh, and other of parliamentary organizations. And it plays an instrumental role in supporting and facilitating the familiarization of policies aimed in realizing um, ASEAN goals and activities. And um, I'm actually quite glad to actually attend um, uh, and, and also chair Dr. Fadli with regards to this, with, um, because one of our strategic um, plan is really to enhance good governance as well. And um, I look forward for us to actually have a stronger cooperation with IPA. And this is something that we would like to actually look into. And, um, and I acknowledge um, the expertise coming in from our, our knowledge, Dr. Bridget, and also YB, and also from University of Adelaide just now. Um, sharing um, from the experience has actually, um, is a very good um, platform, especially for the MPs. And um, I do hope that we can actually work closer, um, Chair, um, for, for this and um, something that we can actually share with our MPs as well. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you. And then uh, now I think it's about 11 o'clock. We have uh, 15 minutes now for the speaker uh, that can uh, probably answer or uh, give more a speech on the question that has been raised by the floor. There's uh, five, uh, five uh, intervention. First one is from Honorable Terachai Puntunas. Second one is from Honorable Adriano Do Nascimento. Third one is from Honorable On Abu Bakar. The fourth one is from Hon Ina Amania. And the last one, is from Honorable Siti Yanti. I know those two names. I know the first name and the last one, yes. So um, now I give uh, the floor to the speakers. Uh, first, uh, uh, to the, uh, uh, probably from the uh, online, Professor Adam Greker. Uh, please, you have uh, five minutes. I give you five minutes. Now it's ten, uh, now eleven o'clock. We will be, uh, conclude this in uh, fifteen minutes. So if you can make in three, it's better. Please. <laughs> okay. Thank you very much, and thank you for those comments. Uh, the most important thing really is to follow up something that uh, Dr. Welch uh, pointed out, and that is uh, there is a whole ecosystem. It is not just laws about financing. They are part of it. And uh, as I always say to my students, uh, there is an old saying that says, if a piece of string has one end, then it has another end. And so we want to be able to find where the other end goes. In some ways, 
You don't fight corruption by fighting corruption. You fight corruption by uh, developing better social systems, better environmental systems, more equity in a society, more senses of belonging, more senses of accountability. And all of these flow into many other different fields. So there is no one single magic bullet. When we look at things like the Global Corruption Perceptions Index, the CPI, we find countries like Denmark and Sweden are at the top of the list. However, if we go back 200 years ago, Denmark, Sweden were very, very corrupt societies. It took a long time. But what happened was there were changes in societal attitudes, an increase in wealth, uh, leadership, government to talk about equity. And so what happens in those areas is there is a political transformation. So you people at this conference, your parliamentarians, you're clearly involved in that political side. The other side, of course, is the bureaucratic side. And uh, that means making sure that the people who administer the laws that you make are in a position to do so ethically. And uh, one what I do uh, in some of the areas that I work in, uh, we try and look at three big questions. First of all, how to make corruption harder to commit. Now, having the law is one thing, but having a culture is another. The second one is how to increase the risks of being caught for bad behavior, because sometimes people can do this with impunity. And the third one, a very important one, is to remove the excuses. Now, Dr. Welch talked about this a little, that people are poor, people need a bit of extra money. And so an excuse is, I am so poorly paid, everybody else does much better, we should be able to do better, one little bit on the side doesn't matter so much for me. So if we think of you know, being able to uh, make it more difficult, you know, increase the effort to be corrupt, increase the risk, remove the excuses, we then have a framework that I would be very happy to discuss in much more detail uh, with people from different countries, because that applies differently in all countries. Because what uh, Dr. Welch pointed out is sometimes there's corruption associated with need. But in many cases, there's also corruption associated with greed. So again, we separate out when's it for need, when's it for greed. If it's for need, you know, there are ways which we can deal with it in terms of financing, labor relations, ma many areas. If it's for greed, then we're back to an ancient uh, political impasse that we've had for a long time. And then we break down the sectors. You know, we look at corruption in procurement, corruption, you know, in uh, financing, corruption in human resource management. So we're continually blending uh, the bureaucratic with the political. And of course, you're talking about political financing. I said we've done a range of uh, suggestions in our blueprint for action, but then that applies to Australia. There may be some lessons you can uh, take from it, but I would never be so arrogant as to uh, suggest how you run your country. I would only you know, be able and happy to assist in a framework that you can then make decisions that are important for you. Thank you. Thank you, Professor uh, Graker. And then uh, now uh, I give uh, the time to Dr. Wells, please. Um, thank you very much. And it, it's really, again, an honor to be here. Um, I just want to pick up on a couple points from the interventions and just uh, very briefly. 
I want to uh, echo and reaffirm the comments from the, uh, the speaker from Thailand, the need for democratic space. Uh, you know, the fact is that at this table, at these conversations, we're not hearing enough from the worst performers in terms of corruption, places like Myanmar, places like uh, Laos and others. Huh? And I think that uh, the first step is indeed creating, carving out democratic space for the elections that are coming. <laughs> The second speaker uh, from Timor uh, spoke a little importance about sharing lessons. And I think uh, this issue of sharing lessons is extremely important. Um, uh, the concrete discussions of YB Lee and others, I think there's much more depth that can be talked about, what can be done in particular components, not just about assets, but also the, the policies that are put in place to deal with civil service reform, which is a very important issue, changing implementation of governance and how to make those practices in the plans more effective. Many of these plans are good on paper, but they're not good in practice. And those lessons also have to come to the table in this conversation. The speaker from Indonesia spoke about the need to look at details in the bills and the details in terms of implementation. Again, I want to emphasize that there is no fixed formula for everyone. That I reaffirm that was this earlier speaker, Professor Gaykar, who talks about the need to adjust to different contexts and different environments, and to recognize that that there are different particular Southeast Asia as a region may have a similar sets of problems, but not all the solutions are the same. And finally, um, as one of the, on the only female speaker that was brought to this conference, uh, and uh, to, uh, it was very pleasant to see many other women uh, who are actually speaking out and to encourage diversity. Thank you so much. Thank you, uh, Dr. Wells. You answer uh, everyone. And then uh, now the third speaker, please, Honorable Le Chen Chung. I'll be sharing the mic. So, um, I will first address a specific question coming from our friend from Timor Leste. Uh, first of all, we have to differentiate that um, asset uh, declaration. Uh, it should be made open, and it's not just selective asset declaration, meaning that uh, we have to make it open to the public scrutiny. That's important. It's not just submitting to your prime minister or our court, uh, but it has to be made open to the public. And of course, uh, it's also a legal document. So we are making a statutory declaration on our assets. So that, that, that's first point and that's important. And secondly, if we broaden the horizon, uh, maybe it shouldn't just be confined to ministers or MPs. Uh, even candidates that are going to stand for election, it will be better if they are taking um, the initiative to declare the assets uh, for public to scrutinize before election and after election, uh, how's your wealth is growing and how is the situation, uh, I mean, after you're becoming minister. And the, track, the tracking can take a long time. Yeah, maybe for a span of 10 years, then you can see that difference. Of course, there are a lot of excuses even within the party and within the government. Some would say it's unsafe because I'm too rich. So I can't declare my, <laughs> my asset. And uh, some other saying is that it, it makes little difference to the people. People don't care about all these things. They care about jobs. They care about foods. They care about cost of living. Why are you doing all these things? But uh, after all, I mean, uh, my fellow colleagues, uh, we all are the leaders in our own field. Uh, it's important to uphold this conviction that uh, uh, having more transparency uh, having more accountability, it will be good, not just for democracy, but also good for our nation in long term. Um, and, but after all, I mean, speaking about all these things, it's also important to realize that um, for developing countries, it's equally challenging to uh, fight corruption. Uh, I will also advocate a few uh, practical solutions, for instance, uh, public financing, public financing for political parties meaning political parties should be financed by uh, the, the, the government so that they can run their daily operation and uh, also to participate in election. Of course, there will be different formulas. Germany have their own way. Different countries will have a different methodology or formula. But as we, as we said that not just uh, cost of living is rising, 
but cost of running election is also rising. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I think it makes logical sense for public to partly subsidize a political party so that they can also be shouted from uh, some corrupted uh, practices. Uh, last but not least, it's also important to put our focus on economic development. I believe that uh, when uh, the state of development is becoming, uh, I mean, more advanced, uh, then when people have more disposable income, we will be less prone to all these corrupted uh, practices. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Please be, uh, give a big warm applause to everybody. Uh, uh, so uh, now I will go to a few summaries that uh, I would like to highlight. First, it's a fighting against corruption is not a solution without aggregating the effective ecosystem which involves the strong regulation, society participation, and effective transparency and accountability system. Democratic space is indeed for achieving good governance with effective government implementation. And there is indeed no fixed formula for addressing the problems of corruption. We need a multi-stakeholders and multi-efforts to address it all. Public scrutiny should be open and transparent. Everyone has a role to play, including parliaments, through our legislative and oversight function. And um, it's uh, been a uh, honor for me to, to, to moderate this first session. And I think the role of uh, Parliament is very important. The role of us, the role of everybody is important to fight corruption. I think uh, now is the time and then everybody has uh, optimism to fight corruption to the future. I think we have to find a better system. So. I think to the future, we know there's a lot of challenging uh, situation for the situation, uh, how we can fight corruption in all sectors, especially in uh, politics. But I think with our commitment, commitment from GOPEC, commitment from CPEC, and also commitment from ASEAN, AIPA, and also the World Parliament, I think we can fight this together. I thank you. I'm Putu Supama Rudana. I thank you. And then I think we have five minutes. I think everybody needs a break of five minutes. And after this, we will be continued by my colleague moderator, uh, Mr. Dia, uh, Ms. Diahroru. Mrs. Diahroru will be here for the second session. And then uh, I wish uh, you can have your break for five minutes and we can continue. But now I will give back uh, to our MC, Ibu Enda. Please, Ibu Enda. Thank you, Pak Putu, for uh, leading the discussion this morning. And some information. Uh, yes, actually, tea and coffee are already served outside. You are free to take uh, tea, coffee, and refreshment and come back to this room. And while waiting for uh, Ibu Roro as a moderator to get ready, maybe I want to invite you all for a group photo. So everyone, please uh, come to the stage and have a group photo. And, and then uh, we'll come back to the second session. Uh, the photographer, please get ready. Should we give uh, get a group photo, Bu? Yes. And uh, I. Yes, but everyone, we invite everyone here to to get to the stage. Uh, tolong protokol dibantu ya, Bapak Ibunya, untuk uh, ini ke depan. Dan juga untuk uh, posisi fotonya. Uh, semua aja pak, semua. Please, please.
Oh, iya, yeah, oke. Okay. And now this time maybe what? Huh? Okay. Oh, yeah, oke. Okay. And this time maybe raise your uh, right hand like this. <laughs> oke. Okay. Bye, bye. Okay. One, two, three. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Silvana juga gak apa-apa bu Indonesia monggo Ibu juga join Musik 